I was at um, the NEK church uh, for church today, and let me tell you, they, the Spirit of God was just moving. We had one, two, three, four, five people in there total, and the Spirit of God was just as strong there as it is here right now. It's, they're, they're, they're praying people. They really are. It was, it was good. We really enjoyed ourselves. A lot of laughs. Um, but I'm up here for just a couple reasons. One, we like to give honor where honor is due. And I know this is making him very uncomfortable, but I'm kind of the, the mom in here. And uh, I've known Cole all of his life. And he has been nothing but a great example to our young people. He's not fake. He's not phony. He's fallen down and he's gotten back up. He's had trouble in his mind trying to work through things and work through it. He's real. What you see is what you get. But he's a hard worker. And he, I, I can honestly say without saying that he probably has to work harder at some things than a lot of people in this room. And he has succeeded. And he told me something at our AIM team. And he was all smiles. Guess what, Sister Griggs? And I am so super proud of him. And you are too. You're just waiting for me to tell you, aren't you? So this is it. He sent me this text. I'm not going to read this whole text. It was a letter that was sent to him saying, congratulations. You have been accepted for membership in the National Honor Society. Cole, you need to know that your church family is so proud of you. And when you fall, we are extending our hand to help you back up again. And when you stand firm and you're a great example to all these young people that are in here, we're patting you on the back. And Sister Griggs gives you hugs. So we are so proud of you. Thank you for all of your hard work and your example. And then the next reason why I'm up here, this is, I don't have to read this. She is my friend, and she has been my friend for a lot of years. I've watched her grow up, so to speak, in the Lord, and we've been through some pretty tough times together, and I couldn't be prouder to call her my sister. She is a generally licensed minister in our organization now, and I am so super proud and honored to be able to say welcome to the mission and come and preach what's on your heart to us today. Sister Hinton. Good afternoon. We're really happy to be here. Thank you, Brother McAllister, Pastor. I don't know whatever to call you. Yeah. I can't have two pastors. That would be a little awkward. So, <laughs> yes. Um, we are going to open up to Luke chapter 14. We're just going to read a few verses, but we're going to talk about a lot of verses. We're going to go to Luke 14, verse 28, and we're only going to go to 30 says, for which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And you can be seated, but as you're seated, I want you to move your chairs that way and that way. All of them. You're going to move them, because we're going to do some, no, oh, no, Bob, you don't remember, because <laughs> we're going to do something different. Oh, okay. yeah. So, this side of the room is going to be one team of engineers. And this side of the room is going to be another team of engineers. 
Each team has 10 minutes to design, collect materials, and build the tallest tower they possibly can. Here's the catch. You only get to have one person come up one time to collect as much building material as they possibly can to help you build your tower. What questions do you have? Go ahead. It, I, all I said was one person can come up and collect as much as they can to bring back, but they only have one time to do it. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Cody. You may not use my bag. <laughs> oh, that is a good question. I did not have a stipulation on that. Yes. Yes, one person comes up to get as much as they can, but only one time. Any more questions? Yes. No. I don't know what to tell you. Okay, but you might want to talk as a team to figure out your strategy before eight of you come up because the stipulation is one person. <laughs> okay, hold on. Your 10 minutes begins now. If you need a time check, the timer is up here. I'm noticing a lot of building on one side and a lot of talking on the other. I notice that people are using the word to stack their uh, buildings on. Sure, before we did it. 
Time check, five minutes. I feel like this is the uh, building of that building in Chicago in the Chrysler Tower. Two and a half minutes left. A minute and 20 seconds are left. I never said that. <laughs> 60 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, 
one. And it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Yours did not fall over. It's pretty stable. It's very stable. You, you can come down. Thank you. Thank you. It's fascinating to watch the different, it's right over there, or Sister Griggs has it, to watch the different strategies. And I was so glad that Brother McAllister was on a completely different team than his wife because I knew it would get interesting. And as soon as she threw herself on the floor, I knew it was game on. Yep. So thank you all for doing that. Thank you for picking it up. My title tonight is Remarkable versus nominal. What was challenging about this? Support, needing support for what? To make the building tall. Limited resources. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, what? Yes, go ahead. Yep, somebody else had a hand raised. Difficult. Right, yes. I loved the creativity I saw in here. And then as you guys kept building, there were more questions that were arising. What was effortless about this? Go ahead. Yeah. Somebody else had a hand raised. Okay. What would you have done differently? Go ahead. Split the blocks evenly. <laughs> Anybody else? I, I thought about sabotaging the other side. I told him if he did it, be prepared for recompense. <laughs> and what did you learn? What did you learn from this? <laughs> I think we already knew that. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. <laughs> yes, yes, they are. Go ahead. Be ready. Yeah. This scripture is talking about making sure you can do what you set out to do. It's talking about leaving all to follow Christ. That's the, that's the title. Um, before this... Luke records Jesus is saying that you have to hate your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, right? Luke records it as that because he is translating exactly what was said. But in Mark, we find a different interpretation of this. In Mark, it says you have to love Jesus more than your father, brother, mother, or sister, right? What we know about languages is that they can be difficult to translate because sometimes we say things and you know what I mean when I leave something out. But the translator doesn't always know my intent because their language is based on a whole different set of values. We have multiple words for pig. We have pork, we have pork chops, we have bacon. But in, in another country, which I am forgetting at the moment, I had it all in my head, I was ready. Um, but they only have one word for pig because they don't value the pig. They don't care, they don't eat it. It's not something that they really care about. So when we say pork chop, they have no clue or 
no way to interpret or translate that word. So when Mark was talking about or in um, translating the Lord's words, he actually was translating a purer form of what the Lord was saying because hate in this scripture does not mean to hate. It actually means alienation, not your home, not where we rest our heart. So we're not to put our heart on our family. He also tells us to bear our cross. <laughs> Jesus was also living in a collectivist society. So a collectivist society is exactly opposite of an individualistic society. We live in an individualistic society. We teach our children to be independent, to care for themselves. In a collectivist society, which Jesus lived in, you were taught that there's a lot of stuff, so I'm going to try and make it succinct. You were taught that your family was, knew what was best for you. So that's why the head of the family made the decisions, because they were wiser, they had more knowledge, they had been through more things. So when people in other countries say that they have to talk to their father or their grandfather because before they make a conversion over to this Jesus way, it's not because they're trying to avoid this. It's because they recognize the fact that their elders have more knowledge and wisdom than they do, and they don't want to make a mistake. And so Jesus is lifting, living in this collectivist society, And he knows he's talking to people who love their families. He knows he's talking to people that put importance and value on this. And he knows that these same people are going to have to make hard decisions. And we also hear him talking about, um, you know, the, the, his mother and his brothers come to talk to him. And he said, who are my mothers and brothers except these in front of me? Right? He was making a statement that his mothers and brothers and sisters were not just physically family. They were also spiritually family. Can you go to the next slide? This has been on my heart a lot lately. This is brother and sister McCarty. I have no clue who they are. <laughs> they started the church. I asked your pastor for um, some pictures of people who um, were important to this church. And I'm sure we could have added a whole lot more. <laughs> but the McCarty started this church. Can you go to the next one, please? Brother and Sister McAllister, we call them B and Sister B, right? They were the pastors here for 20-some-odd years. I came in under them. Uh, when I came to this church, there were 110 people here. And I remember, I don't even know who it was, being up at the pulpit. It might have been Brother Dakota. It could have been Brother Legrand. It could have been Brother Rubinate. It could have been Bishop. I don't remember. But one of them said, and I remember this because I came from a very small church. And um, they said, you know, we're... We're just a small church. And I thought, you're 110 people rocking the floor in this building. I come from a church of 11, <laughs> like, including me. <laughs> like, this is a giant church. You know, and there were people that I remember that, that were doing things. And they were, in my life, they were making an impact. And they were, they were doing things outside of the church building. And... Um, they were teaching Bible studies, and they were talking to random people on the street. They were giving hitchhikers rides to church. Yeah. Brother Grand did some crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Some of you guys did some crazy stuff. Right. Yep. Can you go to the next picture, please? Sister Winners. I remember moving her from Eastbury to some other place. All I remember is Eastbury. 
And that woman had so much wisdom. We may not have liked everything she had to say, but she had a lot of wisdom to share. She'd give you that look. You know, she'd raise those eyebrows. Can you go to the next one? Brother and Sister Kennedy? Man, Sister Kennedy was so fiery. <laughs> but she had a big heart. She loved people. Brother Kennedy, he always had a joke, and I wanted to kill him because he put happy faces on my daughter's fingernails one time. <laughs> but he loved my girls, and he would have done anything for them. Can you go to the next one? Sister Matheson and Brother Matheson. Yep. <laughs> he was a gentle giant. And Sister Jackie, she used to teach Sunday school. She used to teach the youth. She, like, there was, there's just so much stuff that these people did that I don't know that we always think about or that we always remember. Can you go to the next one? <laughs> the peaks. I lived with the peaks. <laughs> I, I lived with you. <laughs> I remember your mom waking you up with waffles and praying over you before you go, went to school. And I remember causing trouble and we were loud and woke your dad up and he was mad. <laughs> I thought he was going to kill us. Thank God he didn't. Um... <laughs> Can you go to the next one? Sister Joyle. Sister Irma. We never called her Sister Joyle, ever. We call her Sister Irma. She can pray like nobody I know. Still does. Yeah. Is that the last picture before the very last one? Okay, we're going to leave it there. We're talking about spiritual family. And um, the Bible refers it, or the Greek referred to it as oikos. You've talked about oikos before. In Hawaiian culture, I really wanted to do this so badly, but I didn't have time or financial means. <laughs> I wanted to take each one of these pictures, and I wanted to blow them up and hang them from the ceiling. So that way, when you walked in, you would be a little bit overwhelmed. Because these are spiritual giants in my life. And they had to make some sacrifices. And they had to do some things. And I remember coming to church and not knowing when I would go home. Not for bad reasons. Just because we were so into hearing what the Spirit of the Lord had to say. And I remember I visited my dad one time on Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving was my dad's holiday. And um, he said, okay, Renee, <clears throat> I'm going to bring you to church. Where are you going to go to church? I said, Pentecostal church, Dad. So the only one we could find was in Fredonia. And um, it was in this, like, old air hangar. <laughs> and the majority of the, the people in there were kids. There were 22 kids and three adults. And so <laughs> they handed out... Uh, musical instruments to everybody. I did not want that musical instrument at all. And they were like, here you go. I said, oh, thanks, I'm okay. He said, no, everybody gets one. And my dad, he told me the story later because um, my grandparents were wondering where I was. And he said, he said, oh, you don't know these people. They are charismatic, crazy dancers. He said, they go with the spirit. They'll be out when they're out. She'll call me. And I thought, <laughs> my dad knows something. He knows something. Why am I showing you all of this? Because I think as a church, not as the mission, not as living water, as a church, we've moved away from some of this stuff. And we can blame it on whatever we want. We can say COVID did it. And you know what? COVID did have a little bit to do with it. But I am sick and tired of allowing this disease or pandemic or whatever you want to call it to control 
how much time we spend with the Lord. And I mean, I even told um, pastor today, I said, yeah, I'm going to take the girls home after because they need some sleep, but I'm sick and tired of doing that too because my girls need Jesus just as much as anybody else. And the more we're spending time in the world, we need to be spending that much time together as a family but also with Jesus, because the more time I spend out there, as much as I'm influencing, guess what? They are influencing me, because not only are you part of my oikos, but so are they. And most of the time, I'm spending way more time out there than I am in here. Not because I don't want to, it's just by virtue of there being one Sunday a week. You know, and I got to go to work five days a week. (laughs) But the Lord wants us to spend time together. He wants us to build a church the way he wants us to. We're going to go to Revelation. I so want to show you this because I'm so excited about it. Revelation chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 14. Can you go to that last picture, please? Verse 14 says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, we always say (laughs) that that's telling us that we either need to be on fire for the Lord or we need to be completely gone from the Lord, right? What do you see in this picture? Ice. Ice. Why do you think it's ice? You think it's cold? You think it's salt? I hear salt. You think it's spring? This is a confusing picture, isn't it? Yeah. We're trying to use what we know and what we've seen because it does look like ice. It looks like it's melting, right? But it's not. This is what the Turkish called Pamukkala. This is in Hierapolis. So Hierapolis, well, it's just outside of Hierapolis. In Laodicea, at the time of this writing... It was about eight miles away from this right here. And you could see this from Laodicea. Now, what makes this remarkable is that there are hot springs underground. You can still go there today and see this. Hierapolis is just to the left of this. <laughs> but they call this, um, they call this Pamukkala. But it's not actually a city. It's, it's just a place to visit. They have hotels and stuff there, but it's not a place to reside. So um, there are exotic birds. So what makes this remarkable is that these are hot springs. And the cal- not the calcium, but the, ca- um, the mineral deposits are what make these pamukkala, or white cotton clouds. That's what it means in Turkish. So, in the opposite direction, about not as many as eight miles, less than that, um, from Laodicea, is Colossae. Now, what makes Colossae really remarkable is its cold springs. They had really cold water all the time. And what makes Laodicea remarkable, no, is that it had no water. It had no springs. They had to get their water from either Hierapolis or Colossae by aqueduct. And by the time it got from from Colossae or Hierapolis, it lost all its remarkable qualities. Oh, yeah. So it wasn't that he he used this specific illustration because they knew what it was like to be lukewarm. My question is, do we want to be remarkable 
Do we want to have some remarkable qualities? Or do we want to be nominal Christians? Because the more we get away from what our ancestors did, the more nominal we become. And we are in danger of losing our remarkable qualities, hot or cold. So today, think about it. What is it? What is it that our ancestors did to make our church so remarkable? And am I willing to be remarkable myself? Or am I willing to allow the Holy Ghost waters from other people travel to me and just become lukewarm? Brother McAllister? Well, on that note, why don't we take a little bit of time, fellowship. The kids are going to be bringing their remarkable energy up here in just a few minutes. But appreciate that, that sermon and message. Um, it'll dovetail with, with what the Lord has for 5 o'clock, that's for sure. But I feel challenged in a very, very good, good way. And if you look back at what the people on that screen did, I think most people think doing what our elders did means literally doing the exact same thing they did. And copying our elders is not what they did. What they did was dig something out of nothing. And so to try to live the exact life they did, have the exact same songs that they sang, um, preach the exact same messages is not actually following in their footsteps. They showed us something that, that didn't exist and how to do that. And if we're going to be like them, we need to tap into that energy. We need to tap into that mindset, that commitment, so that God can do something new and establish something in us. Simply copying Ed, Tim, would be lukewarm. But learning from him and following in that same spirit so you do something unique is following Ed Peak. And so I, I love those types of lessons and sermons. And I haven't heard some of that stuff before, so that's really cool. I like that. But um, looking forward to what God's going to do at 5. Let's shake somebody's hand, smile at them. Trust me, you'll be ahead at 5 if you just smile at somebody between now and then. Praise God. Thanks for coming, Sister Hinton. Enjoyed it.